Canadian Nuclear Laboratory's proposal for a Near Surface Disposal Facility, or NSDF, is a responsible solution for low-level waste that will be generated from the cleanup mission at Chalk River. Let's move this environmental solution forward. Say yes to NSDF. Visit the Virtual Visitor Center at engagewithcnl.ca slash NSDF to learn more and how you can support this initiative. We encourage you to have your say. Hello everyone, welcome to the Construction Record Express. I'm digital mediator Warren Fry, and with me today I have, as always, staff writer at the Journal of Commerce, Russell Hickson, from my this... East Vancouver studios, broadcasting, not live. <laughs> That's very all very true. Um, <laughs> yes. This is a special TCR Express because it isn't all that express, honestly. Uh, we've got Russell, we've also got coming up uh, Angela Gismondi and Don Wall, and they're going to give their mm -hmm. takes on the budget. Before we do that, we're going to get Russell's take on the budget. So Russell, take it away. What was your take on the budget? Yeah, so uh, first of all, let's talk about supply chains. I know uh, a lot of people in the construction sector are just getting obliterated by this, um, you know, wild price fluctuations. Um, for various kinds of materials, some things are very difficult to get. Um, and, uh, you know, in BC, we felt this extremely acutely. Um, and this was mentioned in the budget with the the flooding and the wildfires. Um, and, and the budget addressed this and talked about how that highlighted the importance of, of strengthening the supply chains. Um, and so some of the specific things they talked about was uh, key minerals. Um, so these are critical for for all sorts of of, of things that uh, that are needed, especially like batteries uh, for electrification and uh, uh, microchips are another huge thing um, because we're also in like a huge microchip shortage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting parts for computers, getting uh, microchips for vehicles. Um, more and more things are computerized nowadays. Your refrigerator, your you know probably your dishwasher. Um, just th thousands and thousands of project products, uh, more and more are, are utilizing computing. Um, and so there's just a perfect storm of, of huge demand and then supply chain disruptions. And so they're wanting to encourage more domestic, uh, mineral extraction and they're, they're, they're introducing some funding to try and de-risk that a little bit and help out companies that, that want to get into this, um, yeah, so that that's one of the focuses. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're also going to be spending millions on, uh, you know, supporting supply chain projects in the national trade corridors. Um, they also want to develop data or industry driven solutions rather to use data to make supply chains more efficient. Um, and they also want to cut red tape um, to ensure regulations, uh, you know, are 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 better across the various modes of cargo transportation so like rail and uh by sea um and by air and and, and make sure those all work together a little bit more seamlessly um mm -hmm. so so that's on the supply chain side uh on the energy side uh there was little talk about lng little talk about oil and gas it was all clean energy green energy uh they talked about phasing out fossil fuel subsidies um and there was a lot of uh, 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 space dedicated in the budget to small modular reactors. Um, mm -hmm. So, it, yeah, there wasn't uh, much talk about, uh, you know, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, uh, no talk about, you know, reviving Keystone XL, uh, no no talk about uh, any of those things or, or you know, Canada LNG. It, it was all about uh, some of these other, other things um, and electrification, um, things like that. So yeah, that that's kind of some of my takeaways uh, from the budget. Okay, that's uh, it from the West and now off to the East. Welcome back everybody. With me today I have Angela Gismondi, I'm a staff writer with the Daily Commercial News. Uh, and she and I and pretty much everybody else involved with the Journal of Commerce and Daily Commercial News covered the budget last week. Uh, you heard Vince and myself do a, you know, a sort of a surface level view in an hour or so afterwards. But now we're going for the deep dive. Angela, what did you cover in the budget? 
Yeah, so I spoke to uh, the national associations, uh, national construction associations, um, and they had uh, some mixed views on the budget, I'll say. Um, so we'll start with the Canadian Construction Association. They were pleased um, with uh, one aspect, which was the um, 183 million investment over seven years for the development of innovative construction materials um, and building standards to uh, encourage low carbon construction solutions. Um, but overall, they said that the federal government fell short when it came to providing a plan to address aging infrastructure um, and the future needs and providing the right conditions to deliver um, on the government's build back better objectives. Mm -hmm. um, so that was their their view on the budget. Um, I also spoke to Sean Strickland, who is the uh, executive director of Canada's Building Trades Unions. He had a bit of a different view. He said the budget um, shows that the federal government has workers' backs. Um, so the big news for them was the labor mobility deduction for tradespeople, uh, which mm -hmm. was announced as part of the budget. Um, and it basically provides tax recognition on up to uh, $4,000 per year in eligible travel and temporary relocation expenses to eligible tradespersons and apprentices. So this is something that he says they've been advocating for decades and other people in the industry as well. Um, so this was big news for them. And uh, basically in the past, um, construction workers weren't able to deduct any of their travel costs um, for accommodation and meals when they had to travel mm -hmm. uh, for work. Um, and so he said this this will remove that barrier and allow them to travel to other places and deduct those expenses. So that was big. I also spoke to Ken Lancastle, uh, who's the Chief Operating Officer, the Mechanical Contractors Association of Canada. Um, so he said the, the greening of the built environment and the retrofits mean that there's going to be a lot of work for the mechanical contracting sector. Um, but uh, one of their concerns, uh, the association is stressing the importance of capacity building, uh, particularly with respect to the skilled trades to ensure that the programs, the initiatives, and everything included in the budget, that they're able to deliver those efficiently and effectively. Um, so he said that there's a bit of a disconnect there between the objectives in the budget and the ability for the industry to have capacity to deliver on those projects because of the um, the ongoing labor shortages. So they basically um, just their message continues to be that they want to, um, you know, have a seat at the table, have a voice and continue dialogue with the government uh, on the need to scale up recruitment and retention of uh, skilled trades okay. people across the country to meet uh, government objectives. So overall, a bit of a mixed bag so far with the associations. It is definitely they all had uh, they all had their different um takes on it and like i said some of them were supportive and uh some of them were um you know pointed out some things that were lacking um so uh same thing with john gamble who is the president and ceo of the association of consulting engineering companies canada um he said that you know he's pleased that there was a lot of infrastructure investment included in the budget um but that the association uh, has some questions about the longer term intentions of the government um, when it comes to infrastructure, so they were concerned that there were the budget was lacking details on the national infrastructure assessment. Um, they were hoping to see that in there. Um, and then uh, they were also hoping um, when they were putting their pre budget submission together, they were hoping for a recognition of the importance of critical minerals and mining resources in the country. And uh, he said that the budget exceeded uh, expectations in in that regard. OK, thanks for joining us, Angela. Thank you, Warren. Back, uh, we have Don Wall, staff writer for the Daily Commercial News here. He was also covering the budget. So Don's deep dive involved um, housing infrastructure in the green transition, and he also talked to Ontario stakeholders. Um, Don, first off, what was the deficit projection for this budget? Yeah, well, you know, everybody anticipated you know, increased defense spending, lots of social spending, especially after the deal with the NDP, prepared to, you know, take on the gov challenge the government, but you know, the numbers that came in were, were quite surprising to a lot of people. So for the fiscal year of 21-22, uh, it's going to be $113.8 billion, but declining every year until by 2026-27, it'll drop to $8.4 billion. It's like mm -hmm. quite surprising. And, it, you know, it just, you know, a figure like that shuts a lot of people up. 
you know, it's based on, sure, there's lots of new spending, but uh, mm -hmm. lots of projected revenues and uh, remains to be seen whether those revenues will uh, will roll in, you know, no, you know, it's uh, anticipating uh, strong, strong economic performance. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's kind of a minimal, uh, minimal deficit by, you know, in four years. Uh, the main thing they they and we all knew this ahead of time really was that they were going to be heavy on housing uh, both in the supply side and the demand side and in permitting so maybe you could go into a little bit of that yeah yeah freeland said the government's committing to doubling housing construction over the next decade that's really that's really ambitious you know lo yeah lots of uh work you know stuff uh to spur demand or ena enable buying purchasing uh you know one thing that, that a, one stakeholder identified and then I, I i was scratching my head as well so it uh, you know it says the government considers housing to be essential public infrastructure mm -hmm. uh you know it's and there's a, a statement here you know we're not sure what to make of it this stakeholder with the rccao here in ontario it said budget 22 2022 signals the government's intention to create flexibility within federal infrastructure programs to tie access to infrastructure funding to actions by provinces to increase housing supply where it makes sense to do so. Now, mm -hmm. is that somehow, that's with the Canada Community Building Fund, formerly the gas fund. Is that linking infrastructure funding in some way, especially in, in that fund to housing performance, doing the government's bidding or, you know, that a bit of head scratching and concern there. As always in a budget, there's lots of things, statements made that uh, people are huddling together and trying to figure out what that means and that is one that's been identified as uh you know definitely creating uncertainty i'll talk about a couple of the measures in housing uh you know so on so on spurring uh enabling purchasing so there's a tax-free uh first home savings account and give home buyers uh, the ability to save up to forty thousand dollars doubling of the first time home buyers tax credit amount to ten thousand dollars uh, now on the, uh, something, you know, here's something again, our stakeholders, residential, uh, ResCon, Residential Construction Council of Ontario's taking a look at this $4 billion housing accelerator fund. Ontario mm -hmm. has, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, taking steps to accelerate housing, increasing the speed of permitting, getting rid of red tape. But th so this would work in tandem with that. You know, it's a $4 billion fund over five years to help municipalities with planning and delivery of housing with a target of 100,000 new units a year. You know, but there's no few details on how it will speed up new supply. So, again, that's another one to keep our eye on. Mm -hmm. A couple, couple of other uh, initiatives to for, for affordable housing um, and supportive housing. So, the, the Rapid Housing Initiative, which has been very successful. I, I think there's already been two, two iterations of it. So that's continuing. And there's a new multi-generational home renovation tax credit, uh, provide $7,500 towards construction of a secondary suite for a senior or an adult with a disability mm -hmm. and a new generation of cooperative housing. So, so we're talking, you know, enabling demand, spurring, uh, you know, increasing speeding permitting, and the and uh, and some initiatives for affordable housing. So something for everyone in that in the housing pocket. Now, uh, one other thing is that they have a plan to tie access to infrastructure funding to housing delivery, which makes me think of I don't know if this is the inspiration, but Vancouver did that where they would tie new SkyTrain stations to a community around them and they continue to do that. And I, I wonder if that was part of the inspiration or or if it's uh, sort of in tandem with that already happening. Yeah, you know what's interesting, you know, over the coming months, weeks and months, ministers will be fanning out, you know, explaining some of these policies. So uh, we'll be keeping our eyes open to see what exactly they intend. But maybe that maybe that BC initiative is a model for something. You're right. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, and uh, looking at infrastructure, stakeholders uh, like uh, you've been—they've been happy in recent years with the repeated pledge of 180 billion in infrastructure through the Investing in Canada plan. Um, is that still happening? 
Yeah, well, you know, that's that's still on the books. There was hardly any mention of infrastructure or of that particular infra infrastructure plan, the Investing in Canada plan. And I looked it up. So that was updated on the uh, Canada infrastructure site. You know, so that was launched in 2016, you know, and enhanced over years. So it was 180 billion over 12 years. So there are other streams of in, of infrastructure, but that's that's a, a direct, uh, the, you know, that's the cornerstone plan. You know, that was launched in 2016. That's six years since, you know, since that was launched. And uh, I looked it up. So the government's invested 119 billion in over 77,000 projects. So that leaves 60 billion over the next 10 years or, or eight, you know, or sorry, six years or uh, let's see, 16 to 18, carry the two, just kidding, uh, in another six years. So, you know, at least one, I don't know, a couple of, uh, stakeholders have said, OK, so infrastructure has, has a lower profile now. I, you know, normally they'd reiterate that and find ways to enhance it and promote it. It's still many tens of billions of dollars. But, you know, Gio Cotillo of the uh, of the Ontario General Contractors Association is, you know, he said he's concerned over the lack of profile for infrastructure funding in general. You know, that was a you know, Ballyhood program we're, we're counting on. And, you know, at, at times, lots of complaints about slow delivery and uh, and uh, writing of checks. But, uh, you know, else, you know, so that's something he's watching. Elsewhere, though, there are, there are you know, you know, big, there are big, uh, you know, some substantial new funding for pieces of, uh, for programs anyway. So, you know, Let's see, Canada supply chain infrastructure. That so the National Trade Corridor is fund that uh, they'll be spending up 450 million over five years to support supply chain projects. Much in the news, much discussed in the past two years, mm -hmm. and also um, Toronto, Quebec City, uh, high high frequency rail. There'll be 396.8 billion just for planning and design of that. So that looks like that's a, a project that's that's moving along. So those are, uh, and uh, so yeah, so you know some varied programs, but no, you know, major boost or uh, you know main, maintenance of high profile of that uh, 180 billion dollar, uh, you know, initiative. So. Well, you know that that's something to keep our eye on. It concerned mm -hmm. one stakeholder at least, and others, no doubt. Uh, you mentioned supply chain infrastructure, and one thing I thought of when you said how the deficit was going to go down, I'm like, that's assuming there's not another or further pandemic problems. <laughs> like, sure. that's that's that's. I mean, it's an estimate based on probably economic data, but the, the, as we saw in the last two years, there are, there are curveballs that can be thrown at us. So anyway, that's, back to supply chain infrastructure. Is there anything further they said about that? Because that is something we've definitely been made aware of how fragile it all is. Yeah, that was, you know, that was the major, uh, the major one, you know, that uh, that's spending through the uh, trade corridor fund. Yeah, I didn't, uh, you know, still haven't gone through every line of the budget, mm -hmm. to be of honest, not, yeah. but that, yeah, that, that was the major one that caught my eye. Uh, and uh, you also, you've mentioned in your notes to me here, municipalities in Ontario have uh, had discussion and concerns about their annual capital budgets. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, you know, there's every the past two years, you know, tons of additional COVID costs related to COVID just to keep municipalities in Ontario running and no doubt across the 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 country. But uh, so what's happened, you know, and and municipalities and stakeholders have identified potential dangers of where, you know, uh, especially, you know, lack of funding for, you know, revenues from transit, very, you know, tremendous drop in ridership. So uh, mm -hmm. the Ontario government support from the federal government twice as topped up in 2020 and 2021. Um, this ca capital funding uh, to to enable, to ensure that provinces uh, don't have to dip into their, their capital funding when uh, um, their, 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 their municipal uh, projects, the stream of projects. Um, Patrick McManus of the Ontario Sewer and Water Main Construction Association took a look at that. Toronto has a caveat in its budget. If we don't get some top up, you know, that'll that'll affect us. You know, they've, they've already identified its concern. There was nothing in the budget, 
you know, in, in conversations, they said, well, these were, you know, the two previous times these were executed outside of the federal budget, you know, on an as need basis as we saw what was going on. But there was nothing in the budget for 2022 to do this. And stakeholders are saying, OK, the, they think the spring spend capital spending on typical municipal projects will uh, roll out, but might be a different story in the fall. So that's something to keep our eye on. Stakeholders have identified that a bit of, you know, a bit of a dark cloud there as we, uh, unless there's less the, less the, you know, it's a two part two, uh, bilateral funding from federal and provincial government on that to just to support regular municipal capital projects. So. Watch out for the fall if there's no money coming through. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, those, so those are highlights. You know, as I as I saw them, had good conversations with a half dozen stakeholders, and you know, and uh, they, you know, those I identified some of the some of their concerns here. Okay, Don. Thanks for all your hard work on the budget, and thanks for joining us. Yeah. Okay. Good to talk to you, Warren. Thanks for listening to this special in-depth look at the federal budget. If you'd like to hear more of TCR Express or the Construction Record podcast, you can listen to us on Apple Music, Amazon Music, and Spotify, or on the Daily Commercial News and Journal of Commerce websites. 